Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Eye Openers. Thanks so much for joining us today, Peter. Good morning. Thanks for inviting me. I, I enjoyed your your work on here. So thanks for letting me be part of it. Of course. So um, the one requirement is that you have an eye opener of a beverage with you. Okay, awesome. Tell me about your drink of choice. Oh, I just stopped the dunk on your okay, way in that's, here. That's perfectly acceptable. We got another person who was uh, a Dunkin' Donuts fan before. Yeah, just, it's like a total New England thing to do, right? Yeah, it's easy, right? It's just drive in, drive out. It's kind of on the road. So just threw it in my Yeti and here we are. Cool. I mentioned the other day, I'm a total um, Bolt coffee fan. Have you ever had their stuff? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm hoping maybe they'll come on the show one day because I'd love to hear about their process and the organization. They've really been kind of growing um, naturally in our city. So it's been fun to watch. Yeah, we talked to them actually about potentially doing something here in the Water for Art Center. So Beautiful. Then maybe you can be my connection. There you go. <laughs> Okay, well, I want to give you a proper introduction for those that are joining us. So Peter is um, a 20-year business alum from NYC, and he launched his nonprofit career as executive director and CEO of Tall Ships America in Newport, Rhode Island. That's pretty cool. I definitely want you to let us know a bit more about that. Um, but as a lifelong artist and photographer in 2011, you joined Waterfire Providence as managing director and co-CEO with uh, Barnaby Evans, who is the executive artistic director. So we are going to be diving into like several things today. But one thing you didn't add on your bio, which you and I talked about privately, was your experience running this podcast. So maybe you could tell me just a few you know pieces of information about that for the folks who who weren't there for our conversation. Sure, I, I um I'm always kind of a, try to be an early adopter with technology. And back, I think it was in 2006, I actually started my first podcast, which was called "Messing About in Sh on Ships in Ships" because I was doing maritime stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, and I I worked with a guy who was a captain on a ship, a uh, drill ship in the Gulf of Mexico. So he would be on his ship, and we connect by Skype, and we'd record this. But that then I moved on to a leadership podcast. And I did that for about 100 episodes, and I had a partner who was a Stanford Business School um, lecturer in, um, in California, and we would interview leaders about their journeys, and it was, it was great. We had some amazing leaders um, join us. She knew a lot of people from Silicon Valley because she's an executive coach. Mm -hmm. And um, I knew a lot of people just through the business world and through my maritime career. And we just uh, we just actually had some amazing leaders join us and tell their, their stories. Beautiful. Well, I would love to hear, you know, throughout the questions I'm going to ask you, maybe uh, answering from your perspective, but, you know, maybe giving us a few little pieces of wisdom you learned from speaking to all those other great leaders, too. So I want to ask you, what's your vision for the future? That's a good, uh, that's a really good question, isn't it? Um, and I think uh, in, in normal times, it would be like, I'd give you this grand vision. Right about now, um, the vision is survival, really, for so many people, I think. Um, I run a nonprofit, as you know, and you know, I think lots of small businesses, we're all trying to figure out how to like get on the other side of this pandemic. Mm. So um, that's a, you know, not a great vision, but it is where we are today. And that's part of leadership is kind of, you know, playing with the cards that you're dealt. So totally. um, ultimately long-term vision is uh, continue to grow waterfire and diversify uh, and, mm -hmm. and expand our mission and, and, and bring art into people's lives. And we use a hashtag called art for impact. So um, to continue that creating art that has an impact in both the community and individual people lives. Yeah. I want to say thanks um, uh, to Cobus and Cameron for joining us this morning. Thanks, guys. Um, feel free to post your questions or feedback for Peter below, and we can get to it. Um, yeah, vision is such a tough thing right now, and I I encountered that a lot in the last month because people are asking me, "Gosh, what are you doing to set vision or goals or whatever right now?" And it's like, I. I feel like I used to have like three year vision and stuff. And now I've really tightened that in and, and brought it closer because I want to be able to be adaptable and flexible for whatever is going to happen in the next year. And then kind of go from there. I think some people are thinking the same way. Yeah. Name of the game right now. Yeah. So, so based on that, that vision, which is like a shorter time frame, what do you see as the greatest opportunity within that vision? 
Yeah, you know, I think uh, I think you got to create your own opportunities, right? And and um, I, I'd like to reframe this pandemic as actually creating opportunities. It's a challenge, but it certainly created opportunities for us as an organization. And, and we um, we're 26 years old. And um, just for those who don't know, we do I didn't this. Realize that. Yeah, 26 years old. Um, in fact, uh, our 25 year celebrations got kind of killed by the coronavirus, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So um, we're 26 years old, started as a, our installation downtown Providence and continue as that. And uh, each year we bring about a million people outdoors at night to experience art in an urban environment that would otherwise be empty and dark. And um, we really create memories for people, really powerful memories for people. But we're also, uh, again, we use this art for impact hashtag is um, we bring about a million people into Providence um, and they um, their activity creates about a, a $114 million of economic impact for the state, which generates about nine over $9 million of tax revenue and supports 1,294 jobs. Wow. So Waterfire is this kind of, you know, this art experience that has a big community impact. Part of our strategic plan um, in 2012, we bought this old dilapidated historic building that was really falling apart and we raised money and in 2017 may 2017 we moved in here it's called the waterfront art center it's a 37,000 square foot um art center that's also our home and has multi-uses we like so many nonprofits, were so under-resourced that we had to really focus on doing the event downtown and never had really the capacity to focus on the art center Mm -hmm. The pandemic, I like to joke, has given us permission now because we can't do the event downtown when we have you know, up to 100,000 people on a night until, right. until this health crisis gets solved. But the Art Center now, we've been working on opportunities here like art, like shows, installations, things like that. We did uh, an installation at the beginning of the pandemic called Beacon of Hope where we commemorated each life lost to the coronavirus. Um, through uh, art in in the in the center and ceremony every night at eight thirty, where we laid out these luminaria to memorialize those love, lost lives. So wow. we've been able to kind of accelerate our shift, let's say, our pivot to the uh -huh. people like to use that word yep. to to focusing things here in the art center rather than just the event downtown. So that's kind of the opportunity that that I see um, and that we've been taking advantage of. Okay. So when I think back to, you know, you like you said, the pandemic brought on challenges, right? That we didn't feel necessarily prepared to, to handle. And, um, and then everyone was thinking pivot, like you mentioned, right? But I'm curious, what is the most valuable thing that you learned from a previous mentor or boss that maybe allowed you to pull on some of those uh, ideas of pivoting or uh, managing adversity? Um, that maybe you learned in, from a past experience. Yeah. Um, so I think, it, it, um, and I was thinking about that because he did give me this question ahead of time. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I, I'd say I learned so much from so many different mentors and bosses. However, I would say um, working in an arts organization and working particularly with an artist like Barnaby. Um, uh, and prior to that, I was in the business, you know, in New York City and financial services for 20 plus years. Um, and the we have a perspective of what is possible, um, an expansive perspective about what to do, not not one of scarcity, uh, not why we can't do things, but like why can't we do things? And so, working in an arts organization, and again, particularly with Barnaby, it's just mm -hmm. um, and you have to have a governor on that. You can't do everything, so yeah, there has to be a balance between what you can do, what's possible, but. In the business world, you know, we often try to over manage risk, to almost eliminate risk. And if you eliminate risk, um, you uh, kind of uh, reduce your opportunities to grow. So I'd right. say I'd say that lesson of working with Barnaby and working here at Waterfire in an arts organization has been, you know, eye opening. OK. OK. Very good use of the term. Um, so mm -hmm. so basically your take home message was let's live a bit more in the risk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you, you probably can't see behind me, but uh, yeah, maybe you can right over my shoulder yeah. here. This picture is uh, the back of uh, Providence Business News on the back cover article. And it's Jeannie Cola, and she is the head of LISC. Um, LISC is a nonprofit that invests in community um, uh, community um, uh, projects. And, and the Waterford Arts Center was a project that Jeannie was instrumental in helping us create. And 
Uh, that article that's on my board that reminds me is several years old and it's all, uh, it, it was her talking about risk and it was her talking about this project. And, you know, us willing to undertake this risk not only had created opportunities for us, but it actually helped transform this whole neighborhood. You know, the, the ripple effects of right. when you do things uh, sometimes um, far outweigh the impact you think you're going to create. Completely. And Cameron's saying she loves that idea, like working from expansiveness. And um, yeah, I think that's something that people can definitely learn who are watching because of a lot of like more traditionally business minded people and incorporating that idea is definitely not something you hear about every day. So thanks for sharing that. Um, okay, here's here's a moment of truth, right? What were some early mistakes you made as a leader or manager that now you know better? Yeah. Um, so I think I continue to make these mistakes. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I probably the mistake that, and you know, you're making it and you kick yourself for doing it, but, um, it's probably, um, believing, trying to, to, uh, work with people who may not be able to be worked with. Um, giving people the benefit of the doubt that it might be struggling for one reason or another and trying to bring them along and and then ultimately not being able to bring them along and being disappointed by you know wasting time and resources that could have been devoted to something else. Mm. And then sometimes when you do that, also it has uh, social or political ramifications within an organization if somebody. Yeah, cultural. You know, yeah. So, so, uh, but it's one that I think I continue to make and, and, and willingly and because I rather give people the benefit of the doubt. So it's 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 it was an interesting question. It's one that I don't think I can I'm going to necessarily fix um, right away because I like to I believe in people. I like to try to help people, empower them, and and help them um, realize their potential. And sometimes you just can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. So the, interesting because I've read some research that shows us that as humans we're inherently bad at hiring. Um, we because we we bring too much emotion into that decision, right? And then we make mistakes. Um, I, you probably love my interview with James Kwan. Maybe you saw it already where he spoke about this, like trying to scale this hiring process and trying to remove that kind of margin of error from it. So right. it's very interesting. Um, and then we have, oh, Dan commenting about uh, work with people who believe what you believe and work becomes a lot easier. So Dan's from the Y Institute, if anybody's heard of that, but um, one of those kind of like assessment indicator type things and showing you your type and how you might work better with someone. So people love to use some of those things in the hiring process too, but it's not that easy. Can't just break it down to like, here's an assessment test and like, we'll see if you're a good fit or not, right? And sometimes, sometimes it's not even like the hiring process. Sometimes like we, I've had issues with people who are long time employees that mm -hmm. something happens somewhere along the, along the mix, whether it's an internal dynamic, whether it's a personal dynamic um, that impacts their performance and in their commitment and things like that. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's people are tricky. Yeah. So <laughs> What's been the most challenging thing in managing that? Um, I, I think I think it's having a mindfulness and being aware of of what you're able to accomplish and what you're not, and making sure you don't get too emotional about things. That you try to keep things um, as as uh, you know um, subjective as you possibly can to try to just um, manage the goals and things like that, and, or and as tie objective. things. In. Yeah. Possibly can. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> like, wait a second. There's your problem. <laughs> yeah. 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 There you go. They, we solved it. We solved it. Done. Eye yeah. opener. <laughs> yeah. Um, and having goals and, you know, having goals and, and, and following a path, and having a plan. Cool. Okay. Thanks for honestly, you know, candidly sharing about that because yeah. the, my very like mission in, in hosting the show is to show leaders that they're not alone because a lot of people feel like their struggles are unique and there's not always a safe place when you are at the top of the totem pole in your organization to talk about this, to talk about like, Hey, I'm struggling with this. Or I notice I keep making this mistake. Like, who are you going to talk to about that? Yeah. So I really, um, I'm so grateful for leaders who are willing to come on here and share candidly because it really helps all of us grow. So yeah. And I, I just add that, like I'm part of two peer leadership groups that, that are really helpful in that area that, you know, nonprofit leaders in, in Rhode mm -hmm. Island here, one, we self-organize the other ones through the Rhode Island foundation. 
and it, it is helpful to um, have because you you know when you're leading a nonprofit, it is a it's a pretty precarious situation. Um, mm -hmm. You don't own it. Um, you report to a board of directors, so it's right. not really your baby to really run, but yet you're responsible for everything. So yeah, it's nice to have those people in the community that you can bounce ideas off of. And a lot of times, what you figure, you go into these meetings and you say, "Oh, my problems aren't even that bad compared to." <laughs> <laughs> it makes you feel better. <laughs> and, then, and then the biggest thing is you can help other people. So we, you know, how, how great does it feel when you can actually help somebody else with one of their issues? Totally. Totally. Um, so you've already uh, given us one eye opener for you, but tell me about an insight or a breakthrough that you've had somewhere in your career um, that changed the way you think or lead in your business or life. Yeah, so I, I think it wasn't like an epiphany. It wasn't like that. And uh, you and I discussed this, I think, briefly when the first time we talked. Um, I had the great fortune of going to a high school called Tabor Academy, which owned a tall ship. And for four years of my life, I sailed on a ship, my high school, my high school years. Um, and it was such an empowering, such an incredible experience. Um, it was The ship was run by all the kids except for a professional captain. It was designed around a peer leadership model. And uh, I learned more about leadership during those four years than, you know, I've attended Harvard Business School, Kennedy School, the Wharton School, and the Aspen Institute, and all these advanced leadership programs. Best leadership programs in the world, yeah. Yeah, and 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 the four years of sailing with my peers on that ship, where there's real risk, there's real responsibility, and it's also a very formative time in your life when you're in high school. Um, so, so I think you can really embed and ingrain a lot of lessons and th those four years, um, taught me a lot. It's a peer leadership model. And by my senior year, I was the executive officer on the ship, which was the top person responsible for the operation of the ship. And you got that way because you spent time moving up the chain over those four years and learning the lessons of how to, um, how to do, you know, specific jobs, but also how to lead people. So this is incredibly powerful and something I believe in. And that's how I actually ended up at Tall Ships America is because I was kind of the poster child for this concept of this um, uh, development program that these ships have. Mm. I ended up, that was my first nonprofit job. It was an awesome job. Awesome. You know, I'm thinking about the parallels in um, between that example and in business where there is – tremendous value for top leaders to have kind of worked their way through an organization. Um, a lot of times I'm working with like smaller and medium sized businesses where the founder was the original person like doing the service or, you know, creating the first product, having their hands on it. And sometimes I find that some of these leaders and founders really struggle because they're not in that part of the business anymore. And that the the um, their day to day gets kind of lost because it doesn't have that kind of tactical element to it, the, like sure. hands on. And um, but I I definitely see that value of of um, knowing what each one of those jobs and responsibilities is like, and kind of having an element of mastery of it in order to kind of move to the next level. And I'm I'm you know I'm curious, maybe even in speaking to other people in your podcast or um, in your different positions if that element of kind of almost gamifying um, the the game of business, right? Or, or leadership to, okay, now you pass to the next level. Now you pass to the next level. Where what I've seen in like the last 20 years is less of people staying in organizations for a long time. And this isn't just me. There's so much research that shows us people jump around, yeah. now, right? Two to three years is like the average um, instead of like a lifetime at like GE or something like that, like people used to do. I, I wonder if that's lost, right? There's like an element of this leadership that's really influential and, um, and helpful that's now lost when we move from organization to organization. Yeah, I, I think there can be. It's obviously like the camaraderie that you create when you go through a program like that. But also, you know, so that's, it's interesting here at Waterfire too, our senior leadership team, I, I've been here a decade and I'm still often feel like I'm new. Um, there's so much institutional knowledge and the people we have been together so long. And, um, you know, I think, you know, I think there's a real power to that. Um, you also, often, and I have to, you know, and, and being an arts organization, we continue to challenge ourselves. Mm. Like, so I think you got to, you know, guard against just being complacent, but I think there is a real power. I think it gives us the opportunity to 
um, certainly during this pandemic, we've, I think, worked tightly together from that perspective. So we've lived something together. Um, I think that's probably as important as like understanding all the tasks as you go up through the system. It's like actually experiencing um, experiencing successes and challenges together that builds a team. Mm -hmm. Completely. Awesome. So how can people engage with you? What's the best way to like find what you guys are up to online or if we're not, if they're not in Providence and can't go to Waterfire themselves, how can we engage with you? Yeah, we have an awesome website that'll give you a lot of information about who we are and what we're doing. Um, and we're, you know, the, the art center really is what we've been focusing on in the past um, nine months, I guess you'd say, because of our event downtown and foreseeable in 2021. I'm not sure when we will be able to do it um, until we really conquer this pandemic. Uh, we have some um, exhibitions opening up in January. We have one actually right now. We have the Vanta Guild, which is a black collect uh, photography collective, has their work in their first, really proud, um, actually giving them the first opportunity to exhibit work. Um, that's in our visitor center gallery. And then um, starting on January 5th, 26, we have a major exhibition of the work of sculptor Howard Bentre, who died last year, um, a, a, a Rhode Island sculptor who is known internationally. And then in uh, March, uh, we have uh, Mary Beth Meehan, who's a photographer. And if you're in Providence, you've seen her images. They're on the side of buildings. They're these big billboards. And if mm -hmm. you're into the arts, you might have seen in January the front page of the Sunday New York Times about the fold had an article about her project in Noonan, Georgia, where um, she uses art to kind of um, foster discussions about diversity and inclusion in, in community. And her work has never been seen in one location. And that'll be here. So check out our website, it's waterfire.org. Awesome. awesome. All kind of the activities going on here. I'm excited. Awesome. I didn't know about half of those. So I uh, hope to see you over there. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Peter. It's really been a wonderful conversation. Uh, you have such a breadth of experience and uh, it touches all these different points. So thanks so much for sharing that with us. It's my pleasure and keep up the great work. I, I've enjoyed watching the other leaders' videos. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's good stuff, so keep it up. Thanks so much. So stand with me for a minute. But thank you to those of you who have watched, who've commented and joined. If you're not watching this live, still feel free to leave a comment wherever you're seeing it, whichever platform, and uh, we will answer your questions. So thanks again.